I'd really like to thank the organizers for inviting me today. It's an honor to be a part of this event, and I want to speak about something that I believe is critical in the work of UN Women, uh, and that is a vigorous championing of universality without exception. And I would like to do that in the context of the amazing people power movements we're witnessing uh, around the world, from Morocco to Iran, from China to Sudan, and especially in North Africa. Uh, women are playing critical roles in these movements, and I think that's something we really need to reflect upon uh, as we think about uh, the work of UN women moving forward. I've just returned from Algeria on Sunday, and I had the tremendous honor of observing uh, two of the opposition protests on February 12th and 19th, which were inspired by the heroic Tunisian and Egyptian revolutions in which women played critical roles. Uh, many women were involved in the Algerian demonstrations, which called for a lifting of the 19-year-old state of emergency, which did take place two days ago. Uh, so already a victory, but I'll say more about what that means, victory in brackets, uh, for the protest movement. Uh, but they also called for nothing less than a total change in Algeria's political system. The single most moving part of the February 12th March for Change, from which you saw pictures, was the women's demonstration. About 30,000 police officers had tried to shut down a demonstration of some 2,000 women and men close to 1st of May Square in Algiers. And at a certain point, the feminist activists had had enough of this. And as you saw, they took up a position on the sidewalk with Algerian flags, singing the national anthem, chanting slogans for social change, for gender justice, for social justice. And they absolutely refused to be uh, removed from the space. One of the women involved, the prominent psychologist Sharifa Buata, told me the day before as we watched the celebrations in Cairo uh, after the fall of Mubarak on television, she said, I have been waiting for this for years. This is the beginning. From the years of the fundamentalist terrorism of the 1990s and what came after here, everything seemed lost. Our hopes for a just society were dying, but now the possibilities are fantastic. On February 12th, near 1st of May Square, Algeria's little Tahrir, as some have called it, Sharifa Buata and the other women explored these possibilities, and they refused to cede to the police. The young pro-government counter-protesters, who, like in Egypt, seem to have been hired by the authorities, repeatedly confronted the women. They really targeted the women protesters, and even at one point began shouting in favor of an Islamic state as a sort of direct riposte to the women and their cries for abrogating the family code. The most surreal moment of that February 12th demonstration came as I watched the unyielding female activists viciously attacked by a group of young police women, which makes me think of the point made this morning by Dr. Bachelet about needing women to be gender sensitive too. And it was a terrible irony to watch because, of course, the career paths of these young police women in Algeria were only possible because of the hard work of some of the dedicated feminist activists that they scraped off the sidewalks. The women's human rights defender, Sharifa Khader, who is the president of an organization called Jaze Eruna, an association of the victims of the fundamentalist terrorism of the 1990s, was arrested twice that day on February 12th. And I watched in horror as the police women manhandled her, which, as I wrote, is unfortunately not an oxymoron. Just before she was arrested the first time, Khedar was attacked by a group of the young pro-government protesters who were actually more dangerous in some ways uh, to the demonstrators than the police. Some of these counter-demonstrators attempted to pull Sharifa's clothes off, while another attempted to simulate sex with her. And a policewoman finally dragged her away from this melee, only to help a group of male cops throw her to the ground and arrest her rather than the perpetrators. And this gives you some sense of the tremendous risks these valiant women human rights defenders are are taking, whether here or in many other countries. A few days later, I spent the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad, which is a major holiday in Algeria, with a group of these women activists discussing why they were taking part in the marches. Many of them are involved with a newly created coalition of women's rights groups known as the Observatory on Violence Against Women. They see what they called the women question as inherently a political question, and so their coalition joined the coordinating committee organizing the protests. They want issues like the abrogation of the discriminatory family code, for which religious justifications are often proffered, to be on the change agenda. And therefore, we must march, they say. To Ghayr al-Nidham, changing the system, as you heard the protesters chanting, for them also means absolutely ameliorating the condition of women and challenging social conservatism. I interviewed another woman who told me she was, she was going to the protests, even though she had to hide this from her family. 
I went in between the two marches that I attended, that is the 12th and the 19th of February marches, uh, to interview people to try to understand what the grievances were broadly giving rise to the protests. And I visited one day uh, a slum in Algiers, a neighborhood known as Beb el Wed, which was a stronghold of the Islamic Salvation Front during the terrible 1990s. So I was taken by activists from an NGO, a wonderful NGO called SOS Babel Wed, to what used to be a parking garage, but was turned into what I can only term so-called housing. And I visited, among others, a young couple who lived in two Spartan rooms with their infant. My friendly hostess told me that her husband works as a security guard. She laid out her daily difficulties. My husband, she said, earns 10,000 dinars a month. That's about 130 US dollars. My son's milk costs 300 dinars a can, about $5. It only lasts a few days. His diapers cost another $750, excuse me, 750 dinars. That's about $10. How can we feed ourselves, she said. She tells me there are women nearby sleeping on cartons in the street, and she warns that things could explode here. She supports the marches, but she's not able to participate. She shows me how she plugged the gaps around her windows to protect her son from tear gas during early January's riots, and she says it will be much worse than January if it doesn't change peacefully. Several days later, on February 19th, 2,000 protesters again took the, to the streets demanding that very peaceful change that the woman in Babel Wed was so hoping for. This morning, again, they took to the streets, although unfortunately the opposition has now split in Algeria, so only part uh, of that uh, cohort took to the streets. But again, the women activists, I just talked to them, some of them on the phone, uh, were kicked by riot police. Some of them were beaten, were prohibited from arriving at Martyr Square, where they were attempting to protest uh, this time, were again uh, threatened with sexual assault by the counter-protesters. And they so deserve our solidarity in what will be an ongoing and long struggle for justice in Algeria. Now, I tell these stories for a number of reasons. The first is that I was deeply moved by what I saw, and Algeria is simply not getting the, other, the attention that some of the other countries are, perhaps understandably, given, for example, the terrible level of violence in Libya. Uh, but also, I think that these social movements are some of the most significant human rights developments of recent years. And I really just couldn't take the floor here today without speaking about them. But I also tell these stories because I believe that they are directly relevant to the topic at hand, which is applying what we have learned so far about culture, religion, and human rights in the work of UN women. You see, no one on the streets of Algiers was making a demand based on culture or religion. Like women on the streets of Tunis and Cairo and Tehran in recent weeks and beyond, these women's rights advocates were demanding and sometimes simply taking possession of their universal human rights. Freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of bodily integrity, uh, economic, social, and cultural rights, the right to political participation, freedom from discrimination. When I visited Beb el Wed, none of the poor women I interviewed talked about religion or culture, which are, of course, integral parts of their daily lives, which I don't deny for a moment. But what they were concerned about and wanted to tell me about were their struggles for basic human rights, things like social security, cheaper milk, safety for themselves and their families, hope, just like anyone living anywhere else. No one made claims from a place of cultural or religious particularity, but rather as women, as citizens, as human beings. They were invoking their rights like any human being anywhere else. And I think this is a critical point in a liberal West where we have of late assumed everything to be about identity and difference when it concerns the people who live in Muslim-majority societies. If we shift to particularist discourses, sort of Muslim exceptionalist discourses about women's rights in certain parts of the world, in deference to arguments made by some about absolute cultural or religious difference, I believe we are undermining those women on the streets of Algiers in their quest for full citizenship as Algerians and as women. They do not want that quest for rights to be limited to a discourse of reinterpreting religion. They want their rights regardless of how one interprets religion, as many American women do, regardless of how one interprets religion in this society, which as our moderator so rightly pointed out, uh, is infused with religiosity. In light of this concern, I think one of UN Women's most important contributions could be as an unapologetic defender and promoter everywhere of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that touchstone instrument of the international human rights system and its core notion of universality. The UDHR starts with the idea that the same principles are meant to govern the rights of all human beings regardless of their differences of gender, race, class, religion. 
Human beings qualify for human rights simply by being human wherever they live and whoever they are. I think universality can be a progressive and unifying idea. However, some critique universality, this has become quite fashionable, as being a Western construct, inappropriate elsewhere, and I disagree entirely. Some of universality's biggest critics are in the West, both on the left among postmodernists and others, as well as on the right, the American exceptionalists. Many of universality's most ardent defenders, and some of those who have risked the most to defend and define it, are located outside of the West, many in Muslim-majority societies. And I have seen such defense of universality, for example, uh, firsthand in the work of Afghan women human rights defenders seeking to document cases of atrocities against women, notwithstanding the claim that it is shameful to publish such information. In the vigorous advocacy of the Pakistani women's rights movement currently fighting the blasphemy laws, uh, and the work of Gambian women against FGM despite bogus prosecutions. Now I'm going to split, skip a whole long section of my talk, if you bear with me. Uh, a lot of questions that I want to put on the table, but we'll come back to them. In closing, I wanted to say how proud I am today to be of North African heritage, something I've always been proud of, but I feel a special pride at the moment, given the profound courage and leadership being shown by women and men across the region fighting peacefully for universal human rights. And yesterday, North Africans, in fact, changed the face of international law and the United Nations itself forever in ways that are profoundly moving. The incredible bravery of the Libyan people in revolting against dictatorship, despite the terribly high costs, provoked a special session of the UN Human Rights Council at which the Libyan diplomats challenged traditional notions of sovereignty by saying they represented their people, not their government. And then the council, never an especially courageous body before, unanimously agreed to recommend the suspension of Libya from membership in the council due to the gross human rights abuses by its government. The, hu the Human Rights Council actually showed political, institutional courage. This is an amazing moment. What I hope, and I believe that this will be the case under the leadership of the wonderful Dr. Bachelet, what I hope, and we will have to support her in this, is that UN women will show this sort of institutional courage at every step in defending uh, the principle of universality, in challenging religious fundamentalism, which I didn't even have time uh, really to say much about. Uh, and this will require what Sharifa Khadr, one of the Algerian activists, called a more courageous politics, something that the, even the UN Human Rights Council has shown this week uh, to be possible. Uh, so I'll stop there and thank you very much.